good to be together this evening. I'm grateful for the opportunity to again look into God's Word, and uh, we're going to look at uh, the other side of the abuses sometimes that we're tempted with um, to use our ta- our talents, our strengths, our abilities that certainly have been God given. But when we um, become full of kind of ourselves rather than being servants uh, for God's ways, uh, we certainly can um, use those uh, abilities in ways certainly outside of, of, of how God intended for us uh, to use them. We, this morning we talked about men. Certainly we have a temptation where uh, using that strength and that God-given ability, um, sometimes without his wisdom and without his guidance, we lack the humility to yield in the right way. And tonight we're going to look at uh, where women face many temptations themselves when it comes to uh, being able to see how uh, they can be best used in this world and, and best suited for God's purposes rather than our own selfish ones. And that's going to be a constant battle for all, all of us. Uh, whenever I think about the one we're going to look at here tonight, Herodias and her daughter, there in Mark chapter 6, um, I often also think about a movie. Uh, I think about, uh, it's the movie Rocky. Uh, I remember there was this scene where Rocky's on his, his uh, date with his dream girl, Adrian, and uh, she asks him how he became a fighter. And he says, well, uh, my parents told me I wasn't born with much of a brain, so they said you better develop your body. And Adrian starts laughing, and she says, well, my, he says, what's so funny? He says, well, my parents told me the opposite. He said, what did they say the opposite? He said, well, my mother told me you weren't born with much of a body, so you better develop your brain. And, and really kind of speaks to, that's kind of the worldly mindset sometimes, the idea that, uh, you know, especially for women, um, that, wow, you really came out of the short end of the stick if you aren't able to be blessed with, you know, magnificent beauty and, and, and charm and those kinds of things. Because, boy, with the things you were able to do and the things you can get ahead in life if, you ha- if you're able to wield those in the right way. And what we see is Herodias falls for that. That's exactly what her mindset is. That's exactly where she is in life, is using those attributes that no doubt were God-given, but without God's direction uh, puts us in a lot of uh, very um, dangerous places. Sometimes we don't realize how dangerous it is until, unfortunately, it's too late. But hopefully these can be some, uh, some good guidance for ourselves and kind of uh, pay attention to some of those pitfalls um, that are everywhere for us. But here in Mark chapter 6, I'm going to see again an interesting dynamic between a husband and a wife. And it starts off right away with recognizing that these two individuals never should have been married. Um, they did not have a right to be married. And you see again the dynamic of what happens when uh, certainly you have man's pride uh, joined with uh, a woman's sense of, of pride and validation and certainly just using things to her advantage to get to a position of life. And she wanted luxury. She wanted power. She wanted riches. She wanted uh, to be able to excel as high as possible. And she's really using Herod. And just as we talked about um, this morning, where men have the temptation, um, we're to be strong, we're to be capable, we're to be leaders, but to not manipulate that or to um, uh, become self-centered in that. Women can certainly inspire men, but not to use or manipulate men. Uh, that's, that's where the temptation certainly can be, is realizing that they are in a great position to inspire, but without God's guidance can sometimes turn into using and manipulating. But we see this here in verse 17. Mark 6, 17 says, For Herod himself, this is talking about John the Baptist, had sent and had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. We're going to find out it's a very interesting situation. It says that on account of his wife, which his wife has a lot of sway over him. Uh, and she has known how to do this. And we're going to see that her daughter is learning from her mother how to have sway over men and how to have sway over position to be able to get uh, things that you want and get things that may perhaps uh, maybe other people may not be in a position to have. And Herodias has certainly known how to use charm and beauty and all these things to her advantage. And she is now holding sway over her husband who has been wrestling himself with godly instruction. 
And here's a, here's a man wrestling with godly direction in his life. He has a godly prophet who he has come in contact, con, or contact with, John the Baptist. And it says he actually enjoyed listening to John. He recognized that John was a prophet. He recognized that this was a holy man. I, I don't get the impression that Herod was necessarily all that eager uh, to see how he could be the most God-fearing, most God-pleasing man. But what we recognize is that John's teaching and preaching was having an effect. He was, he was having a moment of pause. We'll, we'll, we'll say that. He was having a moment of, I, I want to think about this. Meanwhile, his wife is, don't you three think about that too much? Don't you, be, don't you be paying too much attention to this? In fact, I want that man killed. And so he makes a compromise. He doesn't exactly kill John because he's too afraid to do that to somebody he thinks is a holy man and thinks, you know, here again, he believes that John has come back from the dead. It's kind of like the boogeyman out to get him. He's a very superstitious man, believes that if you do something wrong, harmful to a holy man, he's going to come out to get you. So we see he has a kind of a shallow understanding of, of spirituality. But nonetheless, he seems to be uh, somewhat um, honest enough in his conscience that he feels he needs to listen to him. But because of his wife, he is not going to just let him run rampant. He's going to keep him at bay and, and provide a little bit of harm to John, so he keeps him in prison. So that's where we find him. It says, um, Herod himself had sinned and had John arrested, bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death and could not do so, for Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. So that's the situation we find Herod in. Again, uh, he's a man full of his own... Uh, uh, Temptations, pride, uh, sense of arrogance, a sense of, of power, kind of gone to his own head and using it however he sees fit. However, here's a moment where God's trying to reach him, trying to get to him, and yet his wife is trying to keep him from listening to the message. And we see again uh, a little bit of a window into no doubt how she was able to do this through her daughter. Herodias' daughter. It says in verse 21, A strategic day came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his lords and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you want, and I will give it to you. And he swore to her, whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you up to half of my kingdom. It's just something we recognize. Uh, this is a girl who um, certainly has been in a position where she is no doubt observed from her own mother. No doubt other women in her life. That here's a, here's a, a unique and advantageous position to be in. Uh, to be in a position where you have some sway and where we talk about charm, the Bible says to be careful about that, that charm is deceitful, not yielded in the proper, humble, God-given direction. It's deceitful and often um, can be taught to use deception, uh, you know, per persuade uh, these men that you're in enticing and, and uh, seducing uh, to believe that you're, you want what's in their best interest and really you're just using them uh, to get the things that you have your eye on. And that's what she's learning and that's what she is being trained even by her own mother to do that. Use your beauty, use your position to get what you want. And notice it says, and we're going to look at a couple of passages that talk about this, especially for men. A lot of, a lot of wisdom and structures given to men to guard ourselves from that very trap. Uh, turn over to Proverbs Chapter 5, Proverbs chapter 5. We're going to look at several Proverbs in this section of, of 
the book that, that kind of has a continuous theme. But notice Proverbs chapter 5 in verse 1. It says, My son, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may observe discretion and your lips may reserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey and smoother than oil is her speech. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol. A lot of practical wisdom is given in Proverbs, specifically to men, to watch out that we aren't vulnerable in a position where we realize we're being used by the manipulating, uh, manipulative uh, tactics of, of a woman using her charm and her beauty, of, of using that to her advantage to get what she wants. It has no interest in the man that she is being flirtatious with and, and, and so nice and so sweet to is using it. And the lot of warnings are coming to men to say, be on guard against that. In fact, notice in Proverbs chapter 6, the warnings continue. Proverbs chapter 6 in verse 24, it says, here I want to warn you to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. Whereas this is not... Uh, uh, innocent. This, it, this has all kinds of potential ramifications for uh, destruction, not for good. And, and, and in a moment of even a man's weakness can kind of lose sight of all those uh, places of warning and of wisdom. And it says that women sometimes are able to, training enough to be able to use that and get into those moments of weakness and can use those attributes for their advantage. And we're to watch out. For that notice chapter 7 proverbs chapter 7 and note in verse 1 proverbs chapter 7 verse 1 says my son keep my words and treasure my commandments within you keep my commandments and live and my teaching as the apple of your eye bind them on your fingers write them on the tablet of your heart say to wisdom you are my sister and call understanding your intimate friend that they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who notice flatters with her words. Very good. In other words, that using her, her sweet tone and, 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 and kind of allurement to put uh, someone at bay and, and, and not have the slightest idea um, that uh, they're being used. They're being used. They don't want you. <laughs> they don't have anything to do with you. But once what you have, once <laughs> the things that you're able to provide looks at you as a stepping stool to get to the next place that she can get as quickly, as fast as possible, and is going to use it. And in fact, uh, turn to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 4, another very straightforward description of some of the things that men need to be wary of, but it's certainly also to make sure that we are uh, guiding women and young ladies in the proper way to, to recognize again the proper godly place for their own beauty, to certainly not to be ashamed of their beauty, to not uh, feel that there's anything wrong with beauty, that God has blessed women with beauty. But there is a, a godly way to use that, especially as we talk about men. There's nothing wrong with the man's strength and nothing wrong with the man's desire to, to lead or, or to um, uh, take ownership of those principles. But as long as they are under the guidance of God's direction, and that's what we need to be uh, very, very careful that we don't, um, take matters in our own hands and kind of take the reins to our, in our own ability and just um, lose sight of that. But there in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 4, uh, just very quickly, wanted to see a description here very early in the prophet's writings. But notice in verse uh, 30, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 30 says, and you, O desolate one, what will you do? Although you dress in scarlet, although you decorate yourself with ornaments of gold, although you enlarge your eyes with paint in vain, you make yourself beautiful. Your lovers despise you. They seek your life. Whereas before it's too late, these men find out what was really up and found out 
They were being used. They were not, it was not uh, anything uh, that was to, to, to their well-being at all. And we're kind of had in the process. And one final passage, Psalm 10. Psalm 10. To watch out again for the temptation to be enticed by power, riches, um, position. That's where Herodias is. Herodias has her mind on one thing, and it's not on God. Her eyes are not on uh, the teachings of God. That's why it's interesting. Herod, Herod was, seems to be the more noble one. He was the one actually said, I want to I listen to what he says. She said, I want to kill him and get rid of him because he's standing in the way of everything that she's had her eyes set on. Because the more Herod listens to him, the greater the chance that he might actually listen to putting her away. She can't have that. She can't have that. She will do whatever it takes to secure that. And so notice it's Psalm 10. It seems to be a very fitting psalm for where she is. Uh, psalm 10, beginning in verse 1. It says, Why do you stand far off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In pride the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. The wicked and the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. In other words, God is in the way. And they're willing to push aside whatever God warns, whatever God says, because they feel that it's in the way of what they feel they deserve or what they're entitled to or what they want to enjoy and have. And Herodias seems to be this kind of a person that is just uh, throughout her life kind of seeing, hey, you know, why would I listen to the attributes and the humility of God? That gets you nowhere. Look at the position I've got now, and I'm certainly not going to abandon it. And she's training her daughter that way. And now her daughter is in a position where, again, we also have the warning now that is charm deceitful, cannot be trusted, it's not honest, it's not loyal, but beauty is vain. Beauty is vain. It's vain in that once it quickly wears off, we quickly realize what the real motives are. That when beauty is no longer there, all of a sudden it's, we realize, wait a minute, you, you were not looking out for me. You had no genuine interest in me. That's what beauty is vain because all of a sudden when it, when it wears down, we realize I can't believe I allowed myself to be influenced by someone who is that uh, manipulative, that uh, self-seeking, and was not uh, someone I, I, I should have involved myself with. But we find sometimes before it's too late, others find themselves being influenced that way. And what's interesting is not only has she positioned herself to wield power over her husband, even as a mother. Even as a, a mother, she realizes I'm in a position where I can wield people and I can simply put them in, in a position that gains her. She's putting her own daughter in a position and is training her daughter and is really using her daughter to get what she wants. And isn't that amazing? Her daughter even asks, well, what should I want? Well, obviously realizing that she never should have been in that position to begin with. But there is a little bit of innocence, I sense, in Herodias' daughter. That perhaps in the sense of the... Because she, she, has, she has, doesn't seem to have the same selfish ambitions that her mother does. She's kind of saying, well, what should I do? And imagine all the things that her daughter could have had for her. You think her daughter really wanted John the, John the Baptist's head on a platter? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't think that's what she wanted at all. She didn't want that. She wanted something that she thought she could gain. And that's what she did. In Mark chapter 6, we find again here with her daughter in verse 22. It says, when the daughter of Herodias herself came in a dance, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you want and I will give it to you. And he swore to her, whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? And she said the head of John the Baptist. And notice in verse 25, this is what she does. She immediately, verse 25, she came in a hurry to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And although the king was very sorry, yet because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests, he was unwilling to refuse her. Immediately, 
the king sent an executioner, commanded him to bring back his head. And he went and had him beheaded in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about this, they came and took away his body and laid it in a tomb. Again, isn't it amazing? All the things that Satan is so good at, it's, it's deception. Deception. The things we think we want, the things we think would be good for us, the things we think maybe that we ought to have or that we ought to pursue. And before we know it, what we find, and that's the thing with, with beauty and, and charm and, and those kinds of uh, uh, beautiful raiments, and certainly God has blessed uh, uh, the, the, the female race to, to, to adorn so beautifully and to, to use that for his glory and can be a true inspiration and a help uh, for so many of us that need inspiration, that need help, that need encouragement. But when Satan comes in and, and deceives, it certainly can be used in the wrong way. And Herodias and her daughter just seem to be um, succumb to that. But John the Baptist, and, and I certainly appreciate John the Baptist, seemed like he, he saw an opportunity to hopefully try to help them change direction. And sadly, he just... Uh, at least in John's lifetime, he didn't get to see it. Um, but he was doing his best to try to teach them the ways of the kingdom. That's what he was preaching to Herod. Repentance. There's a better way. There's a king who all honor and glory and power deserves to be in his hand. And he's a servant. He's a servant to the people who he rules over. And he's looking out for their best interests. And he's a sacrificial king. He's willing to sacrifice his own needs and his own comforts for the sake of what's in the best interest for the people that are under his reign. And I have to imagine that had to strike a chord with, with Herod, no doubt the fact that he wanted to hear more of this. I, I, I'm willing to hear this. And that is, that's, that's, that's encouraging. And, and I think sometimes when we think about, you know, who Jesus is, I know for me, myself, and that kind of puts me in my place sometimes, I think, <laughs> When I kind of catch myself, well, here's the direction I've been going. And boy, I've been blindsided. I've been being so selfish and so self-centered. And I just kind of lost my head. And I'm kind of pursuing all these things that really aren't for my best interest. But I'm deceived in it. And I start thinking about who Jesus is. You know, we sometimes think about Jesus as someone who's just kind of, he's just kind of in the way. That's what, that's what Herodias thought. Herodias thought, John the Baptist is just in the way. Just get, get, get rid of him. He wasn't in the way. He was trying to pave the way. He was trying to help them find the way that would have been best both for Herodias and for Herod and for the daughter and for all those who assembled there that day. There's a better way for us. And the amazing thing about Jesus is he truly helps us redirect our will. When we realize who Jesus is, we realize that he has all authority. Jesus has all power. Jesus has all jurisdiction over life. Everything belongs to him. And he was willing to sacrifice everything about position, everything about earthly honor, because he knew the glory and the honor of serving the God of heaven and wanted all of us to benefit from that. And we get to 2 Corinthians, these passages, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Hopefully that just the example of Christ can help us when we all find ourselves kind of being manipulated it's satan satan is the manipulator he's manipulating us to lose sight of the direction god would have us to go but here's the beautiful direction here second corinthians chapter 6 and verse 13 he says for if we are beside ourselves it is for god if we are of sound mind it is for you for the love of christ controls us having concluded this that one died for all Therefore, all died. And he died for all, so that they who live, and here's the key, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. In other words, when we come to the realization that Jesus gave away all of his own earthly position and comfort, one who certainly had all the, but even remember he said, I could, I could call 10,000 angels and they'll listen to me. I could say to 
any of those angels, stop this and they'll fight for me. They are, they are loyal to Jesus. I don't know anyone else who yields that kind of power. And that was so amazing. But remember the centurion, the guy I recognized, said, I have all kinds of people under me, but I don't have your power. And he recognized, he said, you come, I'm not even worthy of you to come under my roof. You say the word and I know whatever you say is going to be done. People in positions of power and authority, and Herod was one of them, started recognizing this is different than any kind of power I've ever gotten my hands on. That's why he wouldn't put him to death. That's why even though his wife was, yes, able to try to convince him at certain times, but he, he knew, no, I, I cannot do this to this man. And oh, if, if he could have listened further to the message. But here, what a beautiful, a beautiful message Paul puts together for us of, why Jesus is worthy for us to give everything we have to sacrifice for him to die and to no longer live for ourselves, but to live for him. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. He says, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Why? Because this attitude was also in Christ Jesus. He forfeited everything in regards to personal glory, personal uh, 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 riches or attainment of honor on this earth because he, he recognized the spiritual glory he already had and was far, far more glorious and far more uh, precious than any kind of gold or silver or earthly king or titleship he could have had. And he could have had it easily. Like he could have commanded people. He could have commanded people, worship me, bow to me. And they would have, he would have had no choice to do it. You think about that. You think about the power Jesus had to do that. And the kind of power that kings, Herod himself, would have loved to have that power. The kind of guy that says, Lazarus, come forth. You better believe Jesus could say, you, bow down and you worship me. He could do that. <laughs> but he didn't. <laughs> that to me is so hard. Could we recognize how much we own in our own selfish ambition, how much we, if we had that kind of power, would we use it? He had the ability, he had the opportunity. Here, Satan, here, here, Jesus, all the kingdoms of the world, I'll give it to you. You just bow down and worship me. It's not worth it. I'd rather die on a cross. No, that's what makes us surrender. <laughs> He could have had access to all those things sometimes that Satan deceives our, our clouds, our own hearts, that makes us think what we want or that we should have or would make us happy. And Jesus rejected so much of it. Why? Because that's the path of fulfilling joy. That's the emptiness in our hearts that he wants to fill. It's the joy of love, of godly love and sacrifice. And so he says to him, he says, so isn't Jesus worthy of that kind of honor? Because look at, look at the attitude he had. Look at what he gave up. In verse 4, he says, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In other words, he recognized, what's the point if I command and I demand people to follow me? But I'll show you true power when people who just learn who Jesus is beginning to understand the nature of his love and their will 
by sheer sense of willing obedience say, I will gladly follow you and I will put my worthless ambitions in my life to death and I'll be baptized and I'll follow you. That's what John the Baptist was trying to reach Herod with and, and, and it looks like he, he had an opening. He had an opening. And so the, really the question for us is, does he have an op- opening with you? Does he have an opening with us? If so, let's not close that opening off. Let's let him continue to do that work and plant that seed of truth that we might come to full obedience. I do find it such a shame. If only Herod could have had more opportunity to hear John. Perhaps he could have been a great influencer for his wife uh, Herodias to say, hey, you know, there's a, the, the, we're, we're blind. We're blind by our own ambitions. Here's the truth of who Christ is and what he's willing to give to us, what he's willing to offer to us. Let us cast aside all our earthly ambition and simply follow him. And one final example. I always find it amazing that what is truly beautiful about that godly example we find of the description of Proverbs 31 It says, a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And one of the things that's praiseworthy about her, I love it. It says, the heart of her husband trusts in her. Words, when a a, a true woman of, yes, uh, amazing beauty and and elegance and and radiance, but is funneling those things through God's direction, her husband never has to question how truthful her words are. Husband never has to question. I wonder, I wonder if she's just saying this to, uh, to try to you know, use her or manipulate in some way. He, he trusts that she is genuine. He trusts that she's honest. And Esther, Esther is a great example. And some of us want to look at Esther uh, for a final point here to contrast here what we see in Herodias. But turn to Esther 5. Esther is superior to Herodias on two major points. Or, or actually, I'll talk about Herodias' daughter. Look, look at Herodias' daughter. In Esther 5, it says that she had an opportunity to have quite a bit given to her. Now, it's interesting. Remember when Herodias' daughter says she... She danced before the crowd, and uh, Herod was so pleased, he actually says, what can I give to you up to half of my kingdom? Well, Esther got the same reaction from the king that she was married to, only she didn't have to do anything illicit. She just, her mere presence was so beautiful, it made him say that. She just walked in the room. She didn't have to do, she didn't have to open her mouth, she didn't have to say anything. Her beauty far surpassed that of Herodias' daughter, but not only in physical terms, but her noble trusting that God is here to use me for purposes that will glorify him. Because he he says, what what do you want, Esther? She walks in the room and he's just spellbound and she says to her, whatever you want. Esther 5 and verse 3, the king said to her, what is troubling you? What is your request? Even to half of the kingdom it shall be given to you. Esther said, if it pleases the king, may the king and Haman come this day to the banquet that I have prepared for. That's all. I just want a banquet. I just, I just want to talk to you. <laughs> so they have the banquet. Okay, what is it? Up to half my kingdom, what can I give to you? I just want another banquet. Can we have another banquet? I just, I just want to talk to you. And then at that banquet, she even says, I want you to know that what I'm about to ask, I wouldn't ask it if it wasn't extremely important. Or it's if... This horrible news that happened to me and my people. If all that had happened is what we just were, became slaves, I would never ask this. But because this is life and death, I feel compelled to ask you for this request. She wanted this man to know who was so compelled by her beauty. To know, I want you to know you can trust me. And I want you to trust my honesty and that I am wanting what's certainly what's best for, for God, for his people, and for all of us to serve God. And that's a wonderful attribute, I think, that we can all glorify God in when we see that with godly women, godly wives, 
godly husbands working together, uh, glorifying God together. But one final path, just to end on that note, turn to Proverbs chapter 31. I love how it ends on, or it gives that description. And that's what I see in contrast to Herodias. But Proverbs 31 verse 10, it says, An excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. And I love verse 12. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. He never has to second guess. What are the motives here? What's, what's behind this? She's like Esther. Obviously have maybe sometimes the ability where maybe the husband says, hey, you know, I'm so you know, enraptured by, by you. When, you know, I, I, whatever, whatever I can do to serve you and, and, and recognizing that she simply just wants um, godly things in their life. She wants to be a godly help to him. She wants him to be as godly as he can be. And she wants their family to simply do their best to glorify the Lord. And so what a great example we have through this and so many other passages of Scripture. But again, what a great example for us with Mark chapter 6, with Herod, Herodias, and the daughter. That let's be mindful that, yes, Satan is going to uh, deceive us. He's going to tempt us uh, to act and behave in ways that are going to be more about our own interests and be blindsided and not realize we're, we're leaving the path of what God would have for us. If anyone is with us has never obeyed, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We hope and pray that you would recognize that God also is someone who would uh, intentionally didn't want to use any kind of deceit in winning us over. It says, in fact, about the physical appearance of Jesus, there was really nothing that would have made people physically drawn to him. And I almost have to appreciate that the God almost in a way recognizing sometimes where there, there is that uh, tendency to uh, be influenced by, by what we see, that God purposely wanted to make sure that we saw nothing but innocent, trustworthy, pure love that was for our best interest. Won't you be won over by that beauty of the love of God who sent his son to die, who beautifully so willingly was doing that for you so that you might come to the Lord that you might be blessed and be added to the kingdom. If we can help you in any way, if you can confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repenting of your sins, be buried in water for forgiveness. And if you've done that, but uh, need to come back, need to maybe perhaps redirect your own motives and humility and faithfulness, uh, we're glad and more than willing to help in any way. Whatever the need is, once you come to the front while we stand and sing this song, you might obey 